During an unexpected visit, Anthony announced, This is where my parents live, catching everyone off guard. Behind him, his in-laws nodded in agreement, their faces beaming with happiness. At that moment, I was right in the middle of an online meeting. Quickly muting myself, I apologized to my colleagues and ended the call with a hint of irritation. As I faced the door, I couldn't help but wonder about the timing of their arrival. Why the sudden visit? I inquired, managing to keep my voice calm. My dear, we're here to help pay off the house, my father-in-law stated with a proud grin, a statement so absurd it nearly made me laugh. Neither my mother-in-law nor my father-in-law had jobs, yet there they stood, fully supported by Anthony's unquestioning agreement. Disheartened by his support for this unrealistic plan, the thought of divorce crossed my mind. I'm leaving, I declared to the shock of all three. With the mortgage sitting at $6,500 a month, I couldn't suppress a smirk as I began to pack for a business trip scheduled to start the next day. Suitcase and bank book in hand, I prepared to leave. Goodbye, I called out as I walked towards the door, planning to transfer the house title to Anthony. The thought of the future brought a thrill of excitement. I'm Mary, a 45-year-old graphic designer who turned independent four years ago. Since then, I've been blessed with numerous projects, earning significantly more than before. Now, I reside in a luxurious high-rise condo. Two years ago, through Patricia, my former boss and his cousin, I met Anthony. He was kind and honest and had been single for a long time due to his difficulty in maintaining relationships. At the time, my business was flourishing and I had just purchased the top floor of this condo, doubling it as my office. Marriage wasn't in my plans, but Patricia insisted I meet Anthony. When we met, he was incredibly gentle and surprisingly youthful for his age. We hit it off, getting engaged within eight months. Although my parents had passed, my brother and his wife joined me at the family gathering, which included Anthony's parents and cousin Patricia. Despite a mostly smooth meeting, my sister-in-law's remark, this seems stiff, lingered in my mind. Confused, I had never thought her warning would come true. After we got married, Anthony moved into my condo, and we began our life together. His job was grueling, requiring him to leave before dawn, and not return until after midnight, and he earned only a quarter of what I did. Seeing him so worn out each day, I suggested, it might be better for your health to find a less demanding job. But Anthony's reaction was fierce and filled with anger. Are you suggesting I quit? Do you think less of me because I earn less? This was our first real argument, and I was taken aback by his intensity since we'd never fought before. Feeling guilty for unintentionally demeaning his job, I apologize sincerely. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to belittle your efforts. I'm just really concerned about your well-being. Anthony relaxed and apologized as well, and our argument was resolved quickly. But after that, it became harder to bring up the topic of changing jobs. Anthony started coming home even later, sometimes spending half the week at the office. While I worried about his health, he seemed to love his work, so I supported him by making our home as comfortable as possible for him to return to. One evening, Anthony brought up his father's medical bills as his mother was hospitalized with back pain. Could we perhaps increase the money we send to help with my dad's medical expenses? He asked gently. In the hospital room, facing his parents, I sighed internally but didn't hesitate to agree. I had no parents, and our household largely relied on my income, though Anthony contributed a portion of his salary to his parents. While his contribution wasn't insignificant for a man in his 40s, the exact amount he kept for himself was unclear, but it was clear he was providing sufficiently for his parents' needs. Despite this, when he asked to increase the financial support, I found it hard to agree since it would only be possible because of my earnings. Yet, it was difficult to say no in front of his parents. Anthony, you're kind. Thank you so much. It's a big help. 
his parents expressed gratefully, looking at both of us. Under their appreciative gaze, I reluctantly agreed to send more money. Afterward, my in-laws began requesting funds more frequently for various reasons beyond medical expenses. Despite wanting to refuse, I found it increasingly challenging to do so. Aware of my likely refusal, they turned to Anthony, who had a soft spot for his mother's requests. Time and again, he agreed to increase the remittance whenever she asked. On the day we sent my in-laws off in a taxi following his father's hospital discharge, Anthony and I returned home, only to find his parents unexpectedly waiting outside. It's difficult for Dad to climb the stairs, so we thought it'd be best if we stayed here until his back fully recovers, Anthony explained, catching me completely off guard. You can't just decide that without discussing it with me first, I protested, my surprise causing my mother-in-law to frown. My father-in-law stood defiantly at the door, as if urging us to let them in quickly. That's okay, right? Anthony said, looking at me briefly before averting his eyes, signaling that they might have already discussed this plan without me. Reluctantly, I agreed. Fine, you can stay until you're fully recovered, and ushered them inside. As they settled onto our living room sofa, my father-in-law remarked, Look at this place. It's so nice. Our house is 48 years old and falling apart. My mother-in-law chimed in, yeah, it's showing its age. Anthony nodded in agreement, hinting at a potentially extended stay. Admittedly, having them here could reduce the financial strain since I was already supporting them. However, financial ease aside, I wasn't thrilled about the prospect of living together under one roof. Renovating old houses is quite trendy these days. Have you considered that? I suggested to Anthony, hoping to hint at an alternative solution. Yeah, maybe, he responded noncommittally. Three years into our marriage, during what should have been our honeymoon phase, Anthony and I found little time together. We hadn't even gone on a honeymoon. This condo was both my home and office, which was manageable when Anthony was out at work. However, with my in-laws around all day, the dynamics became more challenging if we were to live together, I'd rather move into their house and reserve this place solely as an office. Thanks to my initial resistance, the topic of permanent cohabitation was shelved by my in-laws. However, even months after my father-in-law's discharge, my mother-in-law showed no intention of taking him back to their own home. Their belongings gradually spilled over from the guest room into the living room. One day, noticing Anthony's dad had gone bowling and seemed perfectly healthy, I ventured, Anthony, your dad seems well now. He even went bowling today. Maybe it's time for them to consider going back home? Anthony reacted sharply, his voice raised. What are you saying? Sending my dad back with his bad back is cruel. What if it gets worse? His belief that loud assertions would ensure compliance was becoming a familiar tactic often putting me at a disadvantage, especially since my mother-in-law usually sided with him. This dynamic persisted for three years. During this period, I handled all the household chores while my in-laws often went out to enjoy themselves, despite my father-in-law's apparent recovery. There were no hints of them planning to return to their own home. On one particularly busy day, I mentioned... Sorry, I have a meeting at 2 p.m. today, so I'll be having lunch in my room, okay? I set the lunch on the table and headed to prepare for the meeting. Understood, but leave the dishes for later, my mother-in-law responded dismissively without looking up. As the clock struck, my online meeting began. However, about 12 minutes in, the door burst open. Anthony, backed by his nodding parents, proclaimed, This is where me and my parents live? I quickly apologized to my meeting participants and ended the call frustrated. I told you I had a meeting at 2 p.m., I grumbled as I walked towards the door, calmly asking, why are you doing this all of a sudden? I was met with my father-in-law's smug response, we'll pay the mortgage so you can leave. Suppressing a laugh at his audacity, I simply replied, all right, I'll leave, surprising all three of them. With the mortgage at $6,500 per month, the idea of moving forward with my plans brought an inward smile. 
I faced the situation with a solemn expression, aware of the gravity of my decision. Fortunately, a week-long business trip was scheduled to start the next day. Armed with my meticulously packed suitcase and bank book, I headed for the exit. Goodbye, I uttered, bidding farewell to the home that had become a battleground. The first order of business was transferring the house title to Anthony. Brimming with excitement about the impending changes, I checked into a hotel, eager to start a new chapter. I immediately reached out to a property agent to start the process of transferring my house, which included dealing with the mortgage. The success of the transfer hinged on Anthony's ability to handle the mortgage payments. If he found them unmanageable, the alternatives would be either a lump sum payment or selling the property. Accepting this, I instructed the agent to also find me a new residence that could double as an office space. Given that my work was primarily remote, having a dedicated space for client meetings was essential. The agent quickly identified a suitable location about 30 minutes away from my previous home. It boasted excellent security and after a brief visit, I made a swift decision to purchase the luxurious apartment, seeing it as a well-earned reward for my hard work. In the meantime, I stayed in temporary accommodation. Once everything was ready, I hired a professional moving company to handle the packing and moving. During the move, my in-laws and Anthony were present and, unfortunately, made several disparaging remarks about me. This led to an awkward moment when one of the movers noted, You have a difficult family, leaving me momentarily embarrassed. A week after I settled into my new place, I got a call from a very anxious Anthony. His questions about the mortgage transfer revealed his belated realization of the situation. In the background, I could hear his father loudly insisting I return immediately. Despite their earlier demands for me to leave, Anthony seemed confused about the divorce. But we're getting a divorce, right? It's unfair for me to handle the mortgage if you're the ones living there, he argued. I reminded him of their clear message for me to leave, playing back the recording from the day they'd intruded on my web meeting, which I had taped for documentation. Anthony was shocked, having forgotten about my habit of recording meetings. Undeterred, I explained the impending mortgage repayments, which were subject to a credit check. Anthony, clearly unaware of the details, inquired about the monthly payment, leading to my laughter. Despite my previous explanations and showing him the documents, he seemed clueless about the $6,500 monthly mortgage. His astonishment was evident, and he was left speechless. This prompted his mother to intervene, questioning the amount and asserting that Anthony's salary should be sufficient to handle it. Unbeknownst to his parents, Anthony had not shared the true details of his salary, leading his mother to boldly assert that they would no longer assist me financially. At this, I couldn't help but burst into laughter, which visibly annoyed her. I decided to clarify the situation and revealed the actual mortgage amount. It's $6,500 a month, I stated plainly. What? $6,500 is Anthony's monthly salary? That's absurd. Her shock was palpable, but then she scoffed. That's impossible. Anthony has been sending us $5,500 every month. If his salary is $6,500, he would be sending us nearly all of it. Stop lying, she exclaimed, unwilling to accept the truth. Remaining composed, I directed her to the proof. Look at the shelf right by the entrance of the living room. You'll find Anthony's salary slips there. If you doubt it, check for yourself. Skeptically, she accused me of fabricating the details and went to verify the documents herself. In the background, I could hear Anthony trying to intervene. Soon, her tone changed to one of surprise over the phone. What? There's not even $5,500 here, Anthony. What's the meaning of this? It turned out that Anthony's actual salary was even less than I had disclosed, and I could hear his in-laws bombarding him with questions. You might not hear me, but just so you know, the house mortgage is $6,500 a month. Take care, I declared as clearly as possible. Whether they heard me or not, I ended the call. 
Anthony tried calling several times afterward, but I ignored all his attempts. Let's discuss this through a lawyer from now on, I texted him, cutting off any further direct communication. The lawyer I hired handled the frequent contacts in the following days, which soon quieted down. Eventually, I filed for compensation through my lawyer. After some time, a response came through from my lawyer, and I couldn't help but laugh at its contents. It seemed to be crafted by a team of dubious lawyers from Anthony's side. Their statement was almost comical. The allegations by Shelley are false, and the real victim is our client. We demand compensation for emotional distress. All I could say to my lawyer was, I'm sorry, as the divorce was nearing. Despite the proceedings, our relationship as a couple was still unresolved. I wanted to distance myself from a husband who could make such unreasonable demands. My client wants to meet and discuss in person. Was my firm request conveyed through my lawyer, signaling my intent to handle things formally and conclusively? It seems Anthony doesn't know about this, my lawyer remarked, handing me a letter. The letter requested verification of the claims made by Anthony, suggesting a meeting to discuss them. Through my lawyer, I agreed and chose a location far from where I lived, taking precautionary measures. On the day of the scheduled meeting, Anthony did not appear. Only his lawyer did. The opposing lawyer, a young and polite individual, greeted me respectfully upon arrival. He disclosed that his client was Anthony's mother and admitted that Anthony had been mostly silent during their discussions, avoiding eye contact and allowing his parents to lead the accusations against me. As we talked, the lawyer handed me a document that outlined the supposed wrongful actions I had committed. However, both my lawyer and I quickly realized the document was crafted to paint me in a negative light. I took the time to clarify each point, and the opposing lawyer listened intently, nodding in understanding as my lawyer presented concrete evidence supporting my explanations. I see the content of your statements is completely different, Shelley. You have solid evidence and a strong case, he commented. During our discussion, I corrected a significant error in their document. The opposing lawyer was visibly shocked by the clarity and thoroughness of my explanation. Once our meeting concluded, he left with the same professionalism he had shown upon arrival. My lawyer and I then planned further strategies to counteract the falsehoods perpetuated by Anthony and his parents, reaching out to other relevant parties to discuss potential compensation. About a month after this meeting, Anthony and his parents arrived at another meeting looking worn and anxious. His mother glared at me with hostility, clearly upset by the surroundings, you seem to be enjoying all this trouble. Who do you think is responsible for this situation? She asked disdainfully, displeased with the private dining room I had chosen in an upscale restaurant, a place she once favored. Unfortunately, you don't like this place anymore, I remarked, trying to lighten the mood. You used to love coming here, right? However, her response was grim, her irritation perhaps amplified by their previous lawyer dropping their defense after learning the truth. We were greeted by the restaurant staff who had been briefed on our situation and were escorted to a private room. Anthony remained quiet until we were all seated. Then, unexpectedly, he became emotional. Shelly, I was wrong. Please help me. I can't go on like this. I'll do anything you say. Please come back, Anthony pleaded, stunning his parents. I offered him a kind smile, momentarily easing his distress, acknowledging his plea but remaining cautious about the sincerity of his intentions. As I watched the unfolding drama, I subtly gestured to my lawyer, prompting him to hand Anthony a crucial document. Anthony's complexion turned pale upon receiving it. Before he could read it, his mother, seething with anger, snatched the papers, glaring at me. The document, marked up in stark red ink, meticulously refuted each of Anthony's claims. In a fit of rage, she splashed water on my face, berating me for what she called my arrogance. To everyone's astonishment, I burst into laughter, finding the sheer absurdity of the situation unexpectedly humorous. This unexpected reaction surprised them, including my lawyer. 
Yes, it seems I wasn't the perfect wife, I quipped lightly. I had shared the burden of household chores, endured criticism over my infertility, and even had my earnings manipulated while Anthony's parents continued to press their claims against me. At that moment, my lawyer presented a photograph that silenced the room. It depicted Anthony and a young woman, my former boss, and Anthony's cousin, Patricia, entering a hotel together. The shock was palpable. Anthony was unable to speak against the damning evidence. Patricia stepped forward, explaining the situation and revealing the depth of Anthony's infidelity. With the truth out in the open, I handed Anthony the divorce papers along with the documents for compensation. Overwhelmed by the turn of events, Anthony began to cry, and his parents, equally shaken, were forced to confront the reality of their son's actions. Within a month, Patricia informed me that financial strain had forced Anthony and his parents to move. Anthony's salary was insufficient to support their previous lifestyle, and they were now seeking reduced living expenses. Interestingly, the compensation for my troubles and the deceit I had endured was covered by Patricia's parents. In a surprising twist, Patricia found love with Anthony's former lawyer, drawn to his clear-minded decisiveness. Embracing these unexpected turns, I began blogging about my experiences, which opened new doors for writing opportunities. Since the divorce, I've been courted by a business executive I met through business engagements. Our relationship evolved into a romantic one, and he recently proposed that we live together. As I prepare for our date tomorrow, reflecting on the journey that led me to this moment, I'm seated in front of my computer once again, certain of my decision and ready to embrace whatever comes next.